All right, well, we will go ahead and get started. I want to say good morning to everyone. I am Yvette Blair Lavalle. I am one of the DMIN students in the Land, Food, and Faith Formation track here at Memphis Theological Seminary. In fact, I'm part of the inaugural cohort and am on my way into graduation. So on behalf of Reverend Dr. Jody Hill, who is the president of Memphis Theological Seminary, we want to welcome you to this virtual lecture. We've got a great time in store for us on this morning. We have Dr. Christopher Carter with us and he is going to share so much valuable information. We're going to be able to glean so much insight from him as he begins to talk about race and, and food justice and faith. And so I just want to invite you to come on into this digital room because there is plenty of good space in this digital great hall for each of you. And as we begin our time together talking about race, food, and uh, food justice and faith, let me take just a moment to encourage and recommend the D-men in land, food, and faith formation. Listen, you may be someone who is a community activist. You may be someone who is a foodie. You might even be in farming and you're just starting to enter this conversation around food justice and land and regenerative farming and you've heard so much about it and it has really piqued your interest. And so if that is you and you are interested in learning more about what it means when people talk about food deserts and food swamps and and food apartheid and this lack of access to healthy, fresh, affordable food. And if you're curious and you want to know if there's a way that you can critically explore the intersections of ministry with care for the land and, and these practices of, of how we engage our faith in the community. And if you've been looking for a sign, this is your sign. I want to encourage you to consider the D men in land, food, and faith formation, you will enjoy it. It is a low residency, 32 credit hour program and applications are being accepted right now through April the 30th. If you want to be a part of this next cohort that is coming up in June. So again, if you've been looking for a sign, this is your sign. This is your sign. Now that we've gotten that out of the way, I just want to remind you that um, this is going to be a, a time for us to, to listen, but also to ask questions. So if you've got questions, please place your questions in the chat and I'll be looking through there and we'll raise up those questions for you. But listen, this morning, I am so excited to share with you that we have Reverend Dr. Christopher Carter with us on this morning. Dr. Carter is currently the Assistant Professor of Theology and Religious Studies at the University of San Diego. He is also a Faith in Food Fellow with Farm Forward, and he is an elder in the United Methodist Church. But let me tell you a little bit about how he got there. He earned his PhD in religion with an ethics and society concentration from Claremont School of Theology. His research and teaching and activism interests are at the intersection of black womanist and environmental ethics with a particular focus on race, food and non-human animals, non-human animals. He's also the co-creator of racial resilience. It is an anti-racism and anti-bias program that utilizes the combined insights of contemplative practices and critical race theories. And of course, he is the author of The Spirit of Soul Food, Race, Food, Faith, and Food Justice. The Spirit of Soul Food, Race, Faith, and food justice. So for this next hour, we are going to have a time, a robust time. It is going to be a time that will be well spent. You will be glad that you are in this space. 
Dr. Carter is going to share for about you know 35 or 40 minutes or so, and then we will have a chance to have questions from the audience. So again, as you're thinking about things that you want to ask, please drop those in the chat and I will be looking in the chat for those questions. I want to turn it over now. Let us put our hands together and be prepared to receive the Reverend Dr. Christopher Carter. Good morning, and we are turning it over to you. Good morning, good morning, everyone. It is uh, always a, a pleasure to be gathered by, or, or called in, I should say, uh, by a talented uh, Black woman preacher. That is obvious when I listen to Yvette speak. So, uh, no, it is, um, reminds me quite honestly how much I really, being in San Diego, for those of you who don't know the population demographics here, it's not a lot of Black folks. So uh, I don't get a chance to be in that space, in that community. Um, and my roots, which I'll talk a little bit about today, are in uh, Louisiana and Mississippi. So much of my research was down there. And so um, it's been difficult the last few years not being able to go visit family and go back home. And so even being in this digital space uh, feels a little bit more like home, which is, uh, which is awesome. So thank you all for having me. I'm excited to talk about the book, talk a little bit about my work, and also be in conversation with you all. I do want to note that um, that DMAN program sounds amazing. I think those are the kinds of things that, quite honestly, I believe um if our people and this when we're talking about either the human species or more specifically uh, marginalized folks and people of color if we're going to be able to survive the consequences of what we're dealing with right now with global climate change like these are the kinds of degrees and questions and challenges we have to confront because quite honestly the reality is going to be that we are it's almost inevitable we are going to start um uh, experiencing food shortages that impact a lot of people already right now. Um, that's just what the science says. And I think part of the reason for me that I have to, I've done a lot of podcasts and a lot of um, interviews. And one of the questions people ask is why I include religion in this work. Cause there's a way in which I can easily see removing it and being a conversation. And for me, um, first is to be authentic to who I am, right? I'm a clergy person and I understand my, the work I do as a ministry uh, informed by my call to love, which comes from this love of Christ, but also it gives me hope. Like, I don't know that I actually could do this um, without having the kind of hope of what we Methodists call sanctification, this idea, this idea of becoming more Christ-like. So there are definitely, you will, you will note some, some Methodisms uh, in, in this presentation that is kind of steeped in my bones. Um, I also uh, want to uh, just give a quick shout out to Dr. Valerie Bridgman, who is here, uh, Reverend Dr. Bridgman. She is um, has been a, a mentor and a friend and a pillar in so many ways, and so it's good to see her on here today. So without further ado, I'm going to get to the presentation because I uh, could spend so much time just uh, saying hello to folks. So what I like to do today um, as I was preparing this the last few days, I realized I, I know I put too much on here. I'm not gonna be able to get to everything. However, I'm gonna share these slides um, with you all. So you have, you know, basically kind of a clips notes to the book. And so um, even though I'm gonna go over some slides where I, I probably will maybe only say a few words on each slide, you will have access to these slides. And so that way you'll have an idea of what I'm talking about and go into greater detail. Um, there's my contact information on there. Again, I'm at the University of San Diego. I'm also a clergy person at a church in Los Angeles, because as I mentioned, it was difficult to me find a church uh, in San Diego. So my family and actually, we commute up to LA almost every weekend um, and stay the weekend up there, which has actually turned out to be quite a nice thing. Um, and those are my Twitter and Insta handles. And so I began this book really recognizing that is something that I didn't necessarily want to write. Um, I didn't go to seminary um, thinking that I would even get a PhD, let alone focus on issues of environmental justice. Um, fundamentally, uh, you know, I felt a call to ministry and something that I really was challenged with and wrestled with. And probably like many of you who also felt a call to ministry didn't really want to um, respond to <laughs> uh, in, in many in, in some ways. Um, but that wasn't um, I think once I began to get the confidence intellectual confidence and confidence in my call, I realized that there really wasn't anything I could do about it. This is, you know, um, Jeremiah, right? A fire in my bones. This is just something that was a part of who I am. And so 
in my time doing my MDiv is um, I realized, uh, you know, that uh, I was actually pretty smart. You know, quite honestly, I, I was only, I was an average high school student. I did good in undergrad uh, quite well. I'm the first person in my family to go to college and I was starting to wrestle with questions that pushed me to um, consider doing a PhD and, and I did. And in the midst of my PhD, I began to make profound connections between the stories that I heard from my grandfather, who was a migrant uh, picker, migrant farm worker in the South of Mississippi, um, and connecting that with the kind of food insecurity that I faced growing up and the treatment of farm workers in Central California, as I actually would drive from Claremont, where I went to grad school, to um, San Francisco. Um, and I could kind of see all these exploitations coalescing, right? And it really began to challenge me to think about how and why I should think about environmental justice, but specifically food justice, because um, I can see how it connected with the everydayness of what it meant to be a person of color in America. Ultimately, the conclusion I came to, which I'll talk about later on, um, was something I, I define as soulful eating, which has this aspect of Black veganism in it. Um, and it really was a fundamental way for me to directly confront issues of dehumanization and animalization and racism within our food system. It wasn't the answer that I thought I was going to find. It wasn't the conclusion that I thought I was going to come to <laughs> uh, because so much of my identity and so much of all of our identity is wrapped up in food. And I wanted to belong. I, I wanted to continue to belong. Um, and I was worried that if my diet changed, and if I was really open with that change, that um, I wouldn't belong. Um, Dr. Bridgman could tell you, you know, one of the things I know I, I've struggled with is feeling um, a sense of alienation, um, even in the academy uh, among Black folks because of um, just how poor it was when I grew up and just how different my upbringing is growing up in kind of semi-rural Michigan. <laughs> um, and so I didn't want another thing to push me further away from the community that I already felt like I wasn't necessarily um, a part of in the ways in which I wanted to be. Um, but what I realized for me was that if I framed this work I was doing from the lens of compassion, which I will talk a little bit about today, that that gave me the space to both be compassionate towards myself and the arguments I was making, but also the courage to be authentic and to see the religion of Jesus, as I call it, as Thurman calls it, as a path of radical compassion that allows us to be open to others, uh, to love ourselves and to love God. And it, and in doing so, it gave me the kind of courage I needed to be vulnerable and just say, this is the conclusion I reached. This is kind of what I've come up with and how I try to make it work in multiple contexts. Um, and this is what I believe um, has, has allowed me to um, be able to kind of give the presentations I'm doing today. Um, I call myself a practical theologian because I try to, to discern um, what people believe um, as a distinction between what they actually do. Um, and I believe that this is where we find our humanity, right? And this gap between what we believe and what we do. Um, and, and that is where my ministry is. That's where I think all of our, for those of us who are called to be clergy, that's where our ministry is, is tending to those human needs and that gap and trying to pull us towards uh, our ideals, the vision of ourselves that we know God has called us to be. And so again, I began this um, quest by trying to rethink and reimagine and ask myself, well, what actually is soul food? Um, and really, what are the conclusions I reached by uh, research and study and own experiences, you know, the genesis of Black foodways really is the survival and preservation of the Black community, right? It's about this maintenance and preservation of a folk, a way of thinking, a way of being, a way of eating that we brought over with us from West Africa, that we preserved in the midst of a profound atrocities of enslavement. Um, and that we were able to share with our enslavers as a mechanism for survival. Um, because soul food emerged from this hostile space, um, it's always, I think, going to be met with criticism because soul food, by its very nature, pushes against the colonial worldview of white dominance. Soul food is distinctly Black. Um, it's distinctly African in so many ways, right? Um, at, at its roots, right? It's multiracial, we might say right now, but at its roots is that. And that of course, makes people uncomfortable. That's why you hear the distinction, people try to draw a distinction between soul food and Southern food and things of that nature. Um, you know, and, and I think that's because it pushes up against and it pushes to the front the realities of enslavement that people, as we know right now, with the debates on how we teach history, people don't want to confront. And so the questions for me that began to animate this text is, 
how are the stories we tell about ourselves? How are the stories we tell about traditional notions of soul food still useful? Are these stories tied to certain foods or is the idea of soul food more about the foods themselves or the wisdom of the communities who created these foods, right? These stories is where we find so much of our identity and our purpose. And these kinds of narratives give us a sense of meaning and orientation of how we might be in relationship with each other and how we might be in relationship with the earth. And so I set out as a consequence of thinking about soul food, recognizing that I need to decolonize it as if I was going to question it and try to say, well, what should it look like? I had to recognize that distinctly it emerged through this lens of colonialism, right? So what in the text I call coloniality and coloniality academically is a mindset and not a system that preceded a company to make possible colonial encounters, right? So this is where we start beginning to think about the, um, the implications of this dualistic worldview, this distinction between humans and non-human nature, in the ways in which that gets played out on bodies that are deemed uh, not white, not male, um, not straight, those kinds of things. And so learning how and why our current food system operates this way it does with respect to Black people is what we call decolonizing, right? How we've come to see our food system as normal. Um, this process asks us to unearth and unlearn racist stereotypes, which we'll get into later, um, that I think still inform much of what we like to think of when we talk about the cuisine of our ancestors, right? We haven't, I think something that I try to do is look at that, well, why do we think this is why we eat or how we're supposed to eat? And it also asks us to recognize how the dehumanizing assumptions we use, were used to justify the continued exploitation of Black and other farm workers of color. And so rather than trying to dismantle this um, framework we think about soul food, I think we should recognize that, you know, quite honestly, um, we should be something we should transcend. We should take the knowledges that we know we've constructed alongside and within this colonial framework and add on and build something new in the midst of that. And I think that's consistent with what I try to do in this text. Briefly, just so everybody, because I'm on the same page and I'm talking about, at its core, I'm making an argument that our food system is structurally racist, um, both for, from an economic, political, and ideological framework. I think all this is how I define structural racism. I think these three categories work together. They need each other to normalize and ultimately moralize structural racism. And so we think about the ways in which economically uh, you can trace resource inequalities along racial lines. Um, political, uh, politically, you can trace uh, marginalization along racial lines. So if you think about voting rights and voting access and political power, et cetera. Ideologies, with ideology a bit a set of racialized stereotypes, ideas, beliefs, and attitudes. This is where I spend the majority of the time within this text, dealing with the kinds of moral assumptions and, and ideological assumptions we placed upon food. And I say moral and ideological explicitly because so much of what we come to uh, think about with respect to the food and the language we use around food becomes in and of itself a kind of religion. It is a kind of meaning making mechanism and practice. I also lean heavily into the work of Emily Towns. Uh, her text, Womanist Ethics and the Cultural, Cultural Production of Evil is amazing if you haven't read it, so I highly recommend it. Um, and what I try to do is recognize the importance of how ideologies reshape memory, as she talks about in her text. So in this sense, food justice for Black people requires us to de-link the colonial images and narratives from our historical analysis of Black food ways in order to develop other, the other side of the story or decolonial counter memories. Much of what we, I've come to realize, much of what we think about Black food ways um, kind of is generated within what she calls the white fantastic hegemonic imagination, right? Which is basically just a kind of caricature of what Black folks are supposed to eat. And I think for those of us who are people of color or those of us who are familiar with soul food, as I begin and explain on this further, this will, this will resonate with you. This will seem obvious as I begin to point it out. And so in the first chapter, Transatlantic soul. I, what was amazing about, uh, I say amazing and also super difficult, um, was learning about the intellectual and agricultural culinary genius, is what I say in the text, of our African ancestors. Um, what was difficult was reading pages of uh, primary texts of enslavers who basically had like pamphlets that said, okay, if you know you're gonna grow rice in this, you know, um, in the Carolinas, you need to go 
get Africans from the Senegambia region, the best time to get them is during this time of year because you're more likely to have, you know, the fittest of the of that particular group have been captured. Like they're very, very specific <laughs> on the kind of slaves they which make, if you think about it just from a purely capitalistic standpoint, it totally makes sense. When you recognize you're talking about human beings, it is terrible. Um, this was this is quite honestly the hardest part for me to to read and write um, in the sense that it, reading these narratives it, it it allows us to understand how people can dehumanize other how people can dehumanize others in ways that I think sometimes almost feel impossible. At the same time, with the benefit of reading this of what what helped me understand was often I feel like the narrative that we're taught about black folks and the way we were enslaved is because we were hard workers and we were strong um, and we had a strong endurance. But in fact, it was actually because we were amazing farmers. Like we actually could grow food that the settlers struggled with because of the kind of climate that they weren't used to. The technologies that were used, what we now call regenerative agriculture was what folks been using for thousands of years in Africa, right? And so there's this convenient omission of the knowledge system, the knowledges that were literally stolen, right, from Black folks and imported here um, for the economic benefit of white enslavers. Um, and, and, and that is um, something that I think is important for us as we begin to move forward, particularly the kind of work you guys are doing in Memphis, um, to recognize that, that this really is a reclamation of a knowledge of the ancient wisdom that is a part of uh, our ancestry as Black people. With respect to culinary ancestry, um, I did a lot of research on the Whitney Plantation um, in Louisiana, uh, right on River Road. This is a picture of the back of it. Um, and, uh, and the um, big house, the kitchen right over here in the back over there. Um, and one of the things that it's important to note that many of you probably already know is, you know, the food back then was cooked by slaves and even after slavery is cooked mostly by black people. Um, and there is these assumptions pre uh, Civil War that, you know, black folks just had this intuitive gift with cooking, right? Like, oh, you know, and so this quote right here really captures the way in which people just believe like, oh, there's this, this gift that they've been given um, that they know how to season their food well, which is still the stereotype today, which I find some humor in. Um, folks that it's important to know too, uh, Hercules Washington and James Hemming, um, these are uh, some of the earliest black chefs uh, in America um, that were chefs for future presidents. Um, Hercules Washington was a chef actually for George Washington while he was in um, in the White House. Uh, and again, often, you know, it, no one talks about the fact that the first, you know, chef, if you will, uh, was Black, person who ran the whole feeding operation for the entire, um, you know, White House. And that takes a kind of skill, right, a, a, a kind of intellectual acumen that wasn't attributed to Black folks as being capable of doing something like that at that time. One of the primary reasons that I, um, lean into this reimagination of soul food is recognizing that these stereotypes um, around uh, masculinity, food, um, femininity uh, are all wrapped up in this white hegemonic imagination. And so you see in all of these images, uh, images that I have in the text, stereotypes around black men wrapped up in, in chicken, um, most explicitly. So you see this image right here, this is supposed to be a zip coon, um, who is and basically the idea is that this uh, black folks, um, you know, dress fancy and they try to look a certain kind of way. They look intelligent, but as a matter of fact, they're not really smart enough. So that's why they overdress. And ultimately, they're so obsessed with with chicken. That's really they're really only worried about worldly pleasures. And they can't really focus on important things. Similarly, you have an image right here of a black man looking at a white woman, uh, comparing her to chicken. And you have on one hand uh, normalization of the notion that we need to protect white women's bodies from black male savages, and also this uh, ways in which white women's bodies are commodified as products, right, to be used and to consume um, at the same time. Down here, you see an, an actual restaurant, I kid you not, a restaurant in the menu called the Coon Chicken Inn. Um, and yeah, people went there because the idea was that black folks know how to find and cook really good chicken. Um, and um, that stereotype, again, obviously we know is pervasive in the ways in which some Black folks wouldn't even eat chicken around white people because of that. Obviously, the, the stereotypes are not limited to men. Women <laughs> encounter this as well. The mammy stereotype is nothing that is new. 
you know, I think all of us are aware of it. Um, just that notion that you have a, you know, large black woman who's just so happy to cook for her quote unquote white children. Um, and the ways in which um, it's set up to say like, these are the kinds of things that black women are not only good at, but really all they're really good for. In the midst of all this, right, you have the, um, this way to push back against some of those ideologies begins with the great migration north. Um, Isabel Wilkerson's text, The Warmth of Other Sons, I think is a really good job of capturing some of the hope that wasn't quite um, realized by so many people as they moved uh, north. Uh, and this idea of soul food began to emerge as a, as a way to pay homage to the kinds of ways folks ate when they were in the South back home. Um, and so it, it, it projected, projected this notion that growing up Black and poor and racist society gave Black people an experience of wisdom that was uniquely powerful. Um, there is obviously begins to be pushback against this by people like Elijah Muhammad, Charlotte Hawkins Brown, who predates some of this, but her thinking is still evident in the sense that we're, you know, there, Charlotte Hawkins Brown is arguing that we have to basically do performative whiteness is what I would say to be accepted by white people amongst many other great things that she did. So I don't want to limit her to just this, but this is what one thing she argued about with regards to how we should eat around white folks. And uh, Elijah Muhammad, his argument is that, hey, this food is killing us, right? And, and this is um, poison um, by, um, you know, white people that are really trying to, to harm us. And this kind of thinking begins to uh, kind of have this internalized critique within this notion of soul food. And we see this even today, the ways in which soul food is often wrapped up in class attitudes and class projections on what poor black people eat versus middle-class and upper-class black people eat. So all these kinds of, of, of thinking about soul food still exist today. What I wanna argue is that much of black cookery and the way we think about soul food was kind of developed and conceptualized in conversation with something that Joe Fegan calls the white racial frame. Um, which is simply put just the ways in which like the uh, a more academic term for the white fantastic hegemonic imagination. Um, so black cookery in this sense has been projected as simple, unhealthy, worldly and barbaric because the fantastic white imagination wanted to believe that black people were simple minded, unhealthy, worldly and barbaric. And more importantly, they wanted black people to believe that description was accurate as well, right? So they wanted black people to say, well, this is the food my ancestors ate, this is good for me too right? This is what they survived on, right? They wanted folks to believe that because then it, it, you buy into this projection of who you are as a person and what you can accomplish. So what I argue in this book or in this chapter as I, I, I close out is that we have to really reclaim our soul, right? Reclaiming and decolonizing Black foodways requires that we de-link from the ideologies projected upon Black foodways by the white fantastic imagination and really embraced agricultural knowledges that we brought with us, like a, a claiming of the fact that this was, and in fact, we are an agricultural people and these are ag African knowledges. We need to reread some of these images and actually humanize uh, the people that were dehumanized with respect to the images that were painted that offered only singular um, and a, a, a white projection of, of uh, particularly women, but also black men. And we also need to recapture and reclaim this notion of soul, which I think um, African-American churches, black churches have done such an excellent job at. Um, I think soul and the idea of eating soul food is significant and needs to stay. I think soul, I define soul as the vivifying energy of our African and black ancestors an energy that lives within black people. Um, it's an affect, right? It's literally about how we feel. Um, the affect, the dimension of soul offers black people are not only an acute sense of a felt us, but also a particular affective configuration of us fashioned out of a particular set of affective materials, faith, hope, and solidarity, right? This notion of having faith in God, faith in each other, hope in God, and solidarity with each other, these are the ways in which we begin to feel a community. We feel this energy, right? You feel this presence, the sacredness, these sacred moments begin to emerge. And so I suggest that by fully embracing the decolonial knowledge that is black soul, we create room for our definition of soul food to evolve. So what does that look like? This kind of requires fundamentally that we recognize as black people that our agricultural history includes, but is not limited to enslavement of our ancestors. So much of the ways in which we think about food and growing food is wrapped up in the trauma of slavery. And I wanna say that is traumatic. And so that makes sense that those are first things that come to our mind. 
that we acknowledge the intellectual ingenuity of slaves rather than just complimenting their physical endurance and we demand others do so as well, right? These are people who had a agricultural and culinary genius and we should honor them for that. It requires that we reject racist ideologies associated with black food ways that uphold the fantastic white imagination or the fantastic imagination of white society. That we de-link our definition of soul food from the white racial frame to view soul food as a historically evolving set of foods that have physically, emotionally, and spiritually sustained black people. And that we construct counter memories to critique this white imagination and recast our ancestors as the complex human beings that they were rather than the less than human servants our enslavers understood them to be. Each of these five things are, I think, crucial if we are going to kind of build on a foundation that allows us to rehumanize and begin to each other and to heal from that trauma of our past. The next chapter dives into uh, food politics. I'm not going to spend as much time on this because I think this is more stuff that's for the most part um, more known, particularly those of you who have a more um, a, a background in food and food justice. Um, but uh, in the text, I talk about the ways in which the domestic international food uh, politics um, are rooted in racism and again, structurally racist, um, whether it be the um, Department of Agriculture and the Farm Bill, how 85% of the uh, money in the Farm Bill goes to 15% of the uh, people who grow food, right? So it's really a corporate um, like a form of corporate welfare, quite honestly, is what I would call it. <laughs> uh, and there's this argument that they only need to increase the farm bill so we can increase funding to feed people. But that's actually that there is no evidence that giving those corporations more money, those corporate farmers to grow more food actually ends up in decreasing um, hunger, right? Because what it does, is in they increase their profits, but it doesn't mean they actually have create pathways and mechanisms for the food they do grow to get to poor people. And moreover, Right, it doesn't increase the working conditions or, or, or wages or any of those things that we know actually impact people's lives on a day to day basis. Um, I talk about the importance of black farmers, the fact that we have uh, started out um, with a significant almost a million black farmers in 1920 um, and there's um, a significantly I think 95% decrease that we have right now. Um, and most of that's due to the fact of, of structural objectionist or, or structural inadequacies and un in injustice in the leveraging of resources you could get from the government to actually fund your farm because you have to obviously borrow money to grow seed to sell those kind of things were always done in ways that marginalized uh, black farmers like this assumption again that um, you can till the land you're great working the land but you can't own land you don't know how to manage a farm internationally um, agri-food companies exert enormous influence within three strategic segments of the global food system, food production, trade in both agricultural commodities and food processing and food retailing. Um, interestingly, one of the things that uh, the WTO and other organizations have been able to do is make it such that um, many what we call developing countries are not able to um, subsidize and use things like the farm bill in their own countries to offset some um, and give some insurance and security to their farmers, they have to allow their currency to float free on the market, right? They have all these different kinds of economic structural conditions, basically so that we can exploit them. And by we, I'm talking about literally the West and other countries as well. Ultimately, I argue that a lot of these can be understood, these arguments can be understood through the lens of environmental racism. Um, you know, ultimately that this is how you explain a, what you can begin to begin to understand how these things can happen is because the people who are disproportionately harmed by this are people who are black and people who are brown, right? Um, and in this way, we can look at the global and domestic food systems as a, what oh man, why not, we'll call a racist racial project, meaning that the distribution of goods can be traced along racial lines such that people who get the least are people of color, right? And so in this, we're not talking about intention, we're talking about an outcome. And so I don't know that I would say, we can say this is done intentionally, but I can say the impact of the policies that we have disproportionately harm people of color, poor people, right? Um, and I think there's a sense in which you can talk about rural poverty in the midst of that as well. Importantly in this chapter, I begin to kind of talk about factory farming and how this is one of the ways in which we begin to see the dehumanization that began with enslavement play out today. Um, you know, policymakers are not the only ones who tend to ignore all the labor and the laborers who make it possible for us to eat, because most of us, I think, honestly do the same. But this is how the food system is designed to operate. 
we consumers are not supposed to think about where our food comes from. Um, what, these two articles I have right here, I think really explain the ways in which you still see a kind of racial hierarchy um, played out in factory farms to the extent that um, you have you know, white managers that literally oversee, like they have, they're in plants where they look down upon the people on the lines, where you have black men having the jobs that they do the hardest work, the cutting that is difficult. You have black women who you know are often put in place where they're like working especially in this is in north carolina where they're working with um pigs and they'll be in there cleaning um the intestines like chitlins um and that kind of racial hierarchy again is still present with respect to multiple races in that plant um most recently uh they have the example of the tyson plant in waterloo iowa where you had um managers literally making wages during the pandemic on people's lives, right? So um, they were able, the, the uh, factory farm was able to lobby the Trump administration to be get emergency declaration so they could stay open and get additional funding. And what they did, they said, they marketed, say, hey, we're gonna pay our employees more. But what they did is they say, hey, if you're gonna get this like a thousand dollar bonus, you have to work like, you know, four weeks straight or whatever. And so obviously people wanted that money. So they were coming into work while they were sick the manager started noticing people were getting sick. So they stopped going anywhere near the floor. And then a couple of people made a pool, a betting pool on who would get sick and who would die first, right? That's the kind of logic that informs some of these people. And that's the point I'm getting at and the ways in which you see people who do this work as less than human, right? And so what we have to do is to develop new knowledges, right? This chapter really sought to set light on two assumptions that still inform our phone system that Black people were um, meant to till the land and never acquire the social and political power for land ownership, um, and that corporations exert immense control and influence within our food system. And this has been to the detriment of consumers, farm, and food workers, and the environment. So what might we do? Um, first, we identify areas where we see coloniality operating in the systems as they were presently constructed, um, the economic exploitation of farm workers, food workers, Black farmers, and other farmers of color the dehumanizing working conditions of farm and um, farm workers, poor, rural, and predominantly Black and Latinx communities suffering from food apartheid, and structural racism within the United States, or the USDA and WTO. And lastly, we begin to explore and create alternative models from which we can feed ourselves and our communities, which I'll discuss at the end of the talk today. There is really one chapter in the text that's deeply theological, <laughs> uh, and it's it's my favorite chapter. Uh, I think it's probably the chapter that um, not so many people have um, interest in. Um, and I think for me, I personally, as a theologian, as an ethicist in particular, I wanted to know why people still ate the way they ate or didn't participate in environmental justice movements as I think we ought to. Um, like what was some of the fundamental assumptions that made people think this wasn't as an important endeavor, particularly among people of color, right? Um, and the more I thought about it, the conclusion I came to is that this is a fundamental problem I think we have with our notion of what it means to be human. It's the issue of theological anthropology. Our humanness is detached from this notion of what it means to be in the environment. We see humans as existing outside of the environment. This is a problem of coloniality and enlightenment thinking, right? So we talk about human beings as, as literally existing um, outside of nature. We talk about nature as the other stuff and us as something separate from nature. And that is a part of, I think, a deeply flawed theological anthropology that has led us down the road we're on. And so that's the problem that I'd say I'm trying to address, right? That we've adopted a way of being human that has filtered through the white imagination, which is a racist, sexist, and anti-ecological anti way of practicing being human that justifies exploitation of God's creation, not human nature, human beings, and not human animals. Most of the thinking about how uh, Black folks became, um, how the exploitation of Black people and people of color became normalized, I, I argue, as came in contact with the development of social Darwinism which is basically this misapplying of the evolutionary language of Charles Darwin to politics. Um, what we see in this image right here is, you know, these white, these are actually states right here, like Texas and different other states right here that are good students. And you have these islands, this is Cuba and Hawaii and things of that nature that they're trying to be taught by Uncle Sam how to actually behave. Um, you have an indigenous student in the corner right here with the book, um, 
actually they can't click on it yeah with the book over upside down asian student a chinese student that's outside not even allowed to be in the school and the black person isn't even allowed to be a student right um and so this kind of logic is what we've been inheriting right that these people are trying to become like them people they're trying to become human in the ways in which these kids are human right so they can be accepted by society whereas i argue that liberation theologians and other non-white christians have critiqued the racism that is present in our contemporary anthropologies but we have not sufficiently decolonized the modern definitions of the human non-white people have argued that quote unquote we are human too but being just as human as white people does little to, to deconstruct the racism, sexism, and ecological extractivist thinking that normalizes oppression. We've been arguing, I think, that we should be in this space. What I want to suggest is that this notion of being human and the ways in which we understood through the lens of whiteness is fundamentally flawed. It needs to be rethought. Essentially, with respect to the animal, an open acceptance of the negative status of the animal meaning that the animal is somehow less valuable, less moral worth than human, is a tacit acceptance of the hierarchical racial system of white supremacy in general, meaning that this notion of white supremacy is built upon that some people can be less than human, right? They can be animalized. This means that our modern delineation of the human and humanity, animal and animality, were constructed along racial lines. This isn't probably rocket science or that new, I think, to many of us, because as Franz Fanon noted in Wretched of the Earth and many people of color have experienced, we're often referred to as animals, right? Whether it be black people here, I just read a really long article about um, uh, the Roma people in uh, Europe. Like that's the language <laughs> that immediately uh, gets projected upon black folks, this notion that we are somehow wrapped up in the bestiary. And so when someone disparages a group of human beings as animals or animalistic, they do not mean that the group of people fall outside the scientific category of homo sapiens. Rather, they are stating that these human beings do not look, live, worship, or reason normally, where normal is understood as Eurocentric white norms. In other words, when one does not act white or when one behaves in ways that challenge white dominance, they are dehumanized and seen as an animal, right? And these are just some quotes that I think kind of further that point. Put simply, what I'm arguing is that the methodological reasoning that normalizes racism and white supremacy does not discriminate based on species. The reasoning that creates this hierarchical, this, this hierarchical uh, uh, ways in which we can think about um, evil, where certain beings and bodies have more value and can be exploited, right? Other bodies and beings is wrapped up in this concept of race. Now, I'm not suggesting that the oppression and exploitation of non-human animals is the same as those of human beings. I'm not saying it's the same. However, I am arguing the exploitation of non-human animals normalizes a colonial theological anthropology, right? A dualistic hierarchical understanding of the human person that justifies the exploitation of non-human others, where the human is understood to mean straight white men who perform whiteness as such. And because that's this notion of human that we've defined, that notion of human leads us to normalize anti-black racism, right? It leads us to normalize the extractivist snake we have on our planet. It needs us to normalize the fact that we can, ex we can exploit certain beings that we deem, right, to be less than us, quote unquote, as humans. And so this is taught, I think, more implicitly. Right? I don't think anybody's explicitly taught to accept that um, Black people are less human. <laughs> Rather, I think racial formation ensures that the human is understood to be white, Patriarchy ensures that he's male and heterosexual ensures that he is straight. And so when people of color and women strive to be full human beings within this flawed structure, we are striving toward an anti-Christian theological principle that replicates an oppressive hierarchical model that places whiteness, maleness, and heterosexism as the pinnacles of creation. So unless we attend to the theological anthropology, the majority of Christians and especially black Christians are at risk of subscribing to the theological norms that have normalized our exploitation and exploitation of non-human nature. Fundamentally, we have to rethink about what it means to be human in ways that move us towards a more liberative framework. And so this is what I call um, decolonizing, right? Developing a new theological anthropology. So at its most basic level, I argue that theological anthropology should be able to describe who we're called to be, which I talk about that in the context of self-love, how we're called to live in the context of solidarity, and what we're called to do, meaning the ways in which we are called to be um, in interdependent beings, right? The fundamental norm that makes this anthropology decolonial is that all creation has sacred worth and that no created being should be exploited in the eyes of God. 
for me, the creation narratives play a fundamental starting point. Um, again, this was something I had much uh, conversation with my uh, press because uh, I have a lot of scripture <laughs> in this chapter. But again, I grew up going to a you know semi-rural black church. I actually really do love the Bible. Uh, so when people say, I'm like, ah, you know, I thought about getting a PhD in Hebrew Bible because that's really kind of one of my things. Um, and so for me, I think these narratives have meaning for so many of us, right? We lean into the text and it gives us a sense of identity, a sense of, of purpose and understanding of who we are. And so I think those narratives carry a lot of theological weight and I try to, to do justice to them. And I argue that they really, uh, when you look at them from the perspective of an epic poem, which they are, they present us a kind of framework that leads into these three ways, um, this decolonial theological anthropology that I'm trying to describe. So briefly, I'm talking about the self-love. I'm really arguing that Black Christians need to embrace this notion of the Imago Dei, um, that we really need to see ourselves as people creating the image of God and actually love ourselves for who we are not this projection of who we can be or ought be, but seeing ourselves as worthy of love, which is so difficult because of the trauma that I think we all carry. And a part of what this requires is that we develop a sense of solidarity with each other. This idea of solidarity is premised on an authentic Jesus, right? This Jesus that we might say, um, as Howard Thurman calls it, you know, Jesus whose back was against the wall, not this kind of Eurocentric Jesus that doesn't foster interdependent relationships, right? Um, and so uh, for me, this is about being in relationship with those who, again, Jesus called the least of these. This solidarity extends to non-human animals and non-human nature as well, when the harm is unnecessary for our survival. Now for white folks, this is gonna be different, right? So for white Christians who are committed to decolonial anthropology, embracing the implication of self-love and solidarity require a different focus. Self-love began by mirroring Jesus emptying oneself. So I'm talking about the Christ hymn of Philippians 4. White people must begin to explore and discover who they are outside of the colonia of coloniality in order to love their actual self, not the constructed self that's developed in the white racial frame. And solidarity in this sense begins by cultivating a critical consciousness that decenters the white experience as capital T truth. Rather, it centers social and theological reflections, right, of people of color. This requires what I call, uh, what, what actually I would say, um, Sean Copeland calls anamnesis, the intentional remembering of the exploited, marginalized, and minoritized victims of their historical and ancestral legacy of oppression, right? This kind of remembering is difficult because it brings up all kinds of uh, uncomfort, right, in, in dealing with the traumas. Because again, racism and, and racial thinking has traumatized us all. Um, and because of that, what I do in the text, I spend so much time talking about compassion, and I think one of the challenges we have, what we're dealing with right now with this pushback against CRT is that people wanna dismiss these feelings that come up. And what I say is that we should actually look at those feelings as guideposts, that we should take a U-turn and ask ourselves why we feel this way and to attend to those feelings. Because when we attend to those feelings, we can begin to see the kernel of wisdom that is within them, the ways in which we can begin to attend to our own fears, our longings, angers, and obstructed gifts to actually gain a critical, um, distance from those activities to say, well, what is it we're actually upset with, right? What is it that's actually underneath some of the, 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 the reactivities that we're having rather than projecting them on people of color saying, I just don't wanna learn it. Um, and lastly, holistic interdependence, right? Just accepting that we're created in the image of God and that um, we have, uh, that we are interdependent with other beings. And this way of thinking is not egalitarian, um, but anthropocentric through the lens of Black spirituality, basically that sees all life as sacred. Um, and so in this way, non-human nature is a part of our notion of community. I lean heavily into African spiritualities in this particular section, drawing particularly on Peter Paris's work on the spirituality of African peoples. Now, lastly, I want to wrap up because I'm probably about five minutes longer than I thought I'd be done by now. Um, I want to read this, um, quickly go through these three principles, and then I want to stop. So in this chapter, Tasting Freedom is where I kind of describe soulful eating, the, my suggestions. Um, all right, trying to imagine how one might live according to the three theological principles of self-love, solidarity, and holistic interdependence is to wrestle with the realities of colonial thinking. Martinique and poet and author Ame Césaire captures this challenge in his, dis in his discourse on colonialism. For us, the problem is not to make a utopian and sterile attempt to repeat the past, but to go beyond. It is not a dead society they want to revive. We leave that to those who go in for exoticism, nor is it the present colonial society that we wish to prolong. 
the most putrid carrion that has ever rotted under the sun. It is a new society, a society that we must create, a society rich with all the pro productive power of modern times, warm with all fraternity of olden days. So in developing these three theologically grounded food practices of soulful eating uh, and seeking justice for food workers and caring for the earth, I did not want to retrieve an ideal past or legitimize our current food systems. Rather, I attempted to imagine what soul food should look like today, given the pervasive nature of food and environmental justice, Black, Indigenous, and communities of color, predominantly populated by communities of color and poor people deal with. So soulful eating argues for what I call a, um, it asks us uh, to reflect upon our past, to build on our collective culinary wisdom of our today. Um, eating soulfully asks African-American and Christians to practice what I call an agent-specific and context-specific Black veganism meaning that not everybody can be vegan, right? That's not possible, but it does encourage people who can be to be, and also to create the societies in places so that people have the option to do that, which necessarily causes us to address issues of food apartheid and things of that nature I discussed earlier. Oh, I think I accidentally did this out of order. Yep. Um, so, yeah. So if, uh, part of the reason I argue for uh, Black veganism um, is I use kind of the thinking from these kind of two texts, from Afroism and Feminism for Everybody. Um, I call it a kind of culinary consciousness raising, um, borrowing from Bell Hooks when she's talking about feminism. And so by opting not to consume animal products, Black veganism forces us to explore how white supremacist race thinking extends beyond Black bodies. Black veganism also forces us to examine how the language of animal and animality and animal characteristics has been a tool used to justify the oppression of any being who deviates from white Christian norms, right? Um, and I, I, you see the lowercase black and black veganism because this is an ontological way of thinking rather than you don't have to be black to practice black veganism. You have to be committed to this way of being in the world. Obviously, Sue Bailey Thurman was not a vegan. However, with the ways I talk about soulful eating, one of the practices I suggest is cooking. And Sue Bailey Thurman was not only an amazing scholar in her own right, but uh, she authored this book, the Nash, or she was the editor of this book, the historical cookbook of the American Negro, and uh, talked about the importance of cooking as a mechanism of storytelling, of carrying on our traditions and developing new traditions and how we understand ourselves to be as a people. Justice for food workers really is some of the basic things you probably already know about with respect to um, trying to humanize food workers uh, through fair wages. Um, buying fair trade, buying local, becoming politically active. One of the things I think um, the inspirations for this is the work of Fannie Lou Hamer um, and her Freedom Farm Cooperative. She did so much for food justice that I think people don't know about. And I would highly recommend uh, learning more about that. These are some of the spaces where this work is being done right now. The Black Trust Food Security Network, Duke World Food Policy Center is doing work on here, trying to recognize church land as farmland to create food sovereign spaces. And lastly, caring for the earth. Um, this talks about cultivating um, better relations with the land. Some of the things that I think you all are doing right now, actually with the program you have, Seminary Hill Farm uh, on MSTO, uh, I've already worked with them and I mentioned that earlier. Soul Fire Farm, I think is doing amazing work out in upstate New York, uh, based on not Christian principles, but religious principles about um, the ways in which black people can reconnect to the land and the work of people like Wangari Matai, um, and, you know, uh, passed away several years ago, but an activist with respect to um, African agriculture. So thank you and for letting me go over uh, actually probably about 10 minutes longer than I anticipated. So I apologize for that. Um, but I didn't want to go too fast <laughs> and give people time to actually hear what I had to say. Um, I'm sure there's lots of questions. So I look forward to engaging them. <laughs>